talking to us this morning. Um, maybe I can start uh, by asking you why the Rebuilding Macroeconomic Centre was actually set up in the first place. The Economic and Social Research Council issued a call which really raised two um, concerns that they have. First, a perceived disconnect between academia, particularly with respect to macroeconomics and policy makers. And second, the view that there has perhaps been something of a monoculture um, in economics, but again, with particular regard to macroeconomics. I think it's not a stretch to say that, of course, both of these concerns were probably heightened during and in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, where the link between academic macroeconomics and what practitioners had to deal with um, perhaps was not as close as one would have wanted. And secondly, that the dominant paradigm in the run-up to the crisis, in hindsight, perhaps had some shortcomings, quite significant ones, such as, for example, not even having a financial sector. That became a glaring fault. Uh, and the power of that monoculture in academic departments was something of a concern. So both of these factors brought out really by the global financial crisis was the motive for the ESRC issuing the call. And why did you and uh, NISA uh, uh, particularly want to um, bid for it and uh, lead this centre? Well, my personal career uh, has gone through uh, working in academic institutions to working in a um, uh, uh, policy-making environment, particularly during the crisis. So you were actually there on the spot in Treasury? Oh, yes. I was um, uh, wrote a, a significant amount of the advice. Um, I was very involved in at least the Treasury's response uh, during the crisis. I'd also lived through the Asian crisis, which was in many ways it's hard to believe it, but in many ways, probably more dramatic. Uh, it really almost pulled countries apart. And it was after that that I decided to return to academia, having realized just the extent of damage that uh, misguided macroeconomic and financial policy could lead to huge detrimental consequences in social um, and human uh, terms. It was really very shocking what happened in Asia, uh, as was the response afterwards, which was, this was just about crony capitalism, nothing at all to do with uh, e either economics or finance or the whole system, and everybody moved on. Well, you know, 10 years later, it came and uh, returned to our shores. Um, the parallels were uncanny. And so it was really through that process that my personal interest in actually trying to change things um, was really uh, had been fermented. For the National Institute, which is the host of Rebuilding Macroeconomics, the National Institute has always tried to be uh, involved in uh, the debate between academia and again policy making. And that is why this was really such an ideal place uh, to hold uh, to host this this network, so they were the main reasons. I think the reason that why we were successful is because um, again the National Institute of Economic and Social Research was that the ESRC's call particularly asked for um, uh, to bring into interdisciplinary knowledge and new methods, and of course the economics and the social research in NISA play, uh, you know, it's long been part of our tradition, so it's quite straightforward to do that. And indeed, the structure of the network has got more non-economists in it than economists. And actually, I suppose it doesn't actually, your, your network or winning bid didn't have uh, the heterodox, so-called heterodox economics uh, community as such, did it? Well, we had um, uh, people who, uh, take part in, say, post-Keynesian conferences who are known post-Keynesian have published work in uh, post-Keynesian journals. We have people who um, have worked in new methods in macroeconomics, uh, such as agent-based modeling, 
Uh, both of those uh, people I'm thinking of are in the management team. In so, so you know, the management team is five people, so there's a limit. There's one economist who has who does attend so called heterodox uh, conferences. Um, there's an anthropologist, a psychologist, and a complexity theorist. So, I think that's enough uh, diversity, at least in terms of scholastic background. And um how is this uh, network uh, going to work? How does the structure work? Um, how would you engage outside uh, the, the core as you go forward? Well, I think it's probably a good place to start with what is our objective. Our objective is um, to start the transformation of macroeconomics back into being a policy-relevant social science. Macroeconomics was really created in response to the Great, to the great Depression um, to try to deal with some of the glaring problems, uh, both the causes and the consequences of the Great Depression. One could argue that over the last couple of decades, it's become rather removed from uh, the real world. So the aim here is to try and start um, that transformation back to policy relevance. Now, at the end of the four years of funding, we have to present a roadmap to the Economic and Social Research Council, setting out the directions of new research we think are the most promising to deliver that transformation. So our job is really to try and uh, uh, encourage and find genuinely new and ambitious pilot projects, which are sort of proof of principle projects, and to nurture those and support and fund those to find out what are going to be the new areas of the new directions of uh, research which might enable macroeconomics uh, to further this, this program. I should just say, of course, that since the crisis, there has been um, a considerable change in macroeconomics. There's been a lot more applied work. There's been many attempts to um, rectify obvious shortcomings, such as the lack of financial system uh, in these models. And so this should really be seen as complementary to that. As well as macroeconomists working away at this, we're looking to support people who are either macroeconomists, perhaps working in heterodox areas, but also people who are not macroeconomists, who want to bring new methods from uh, different uh, social sciences, but also physical sciences into macroeconomics. And so it's really bringing in those people. That's the nature of the network. Now, to organize ourselves, we've said that we're going to be um, organized under six to eight research hubs. Each of those research hubs uh, will ask a very simple but uh, fundamental question, such as, can globalization benefit everyone? Or, why are economies unstable? Or another, um, how do we achieve a uh, sustainable economy? These are obvious, big, profound questions where macroeconomics should really play a key part. These are big, deep questions that affect all of us. So the objective is to set up six to eight of these hubs. We've uh, filled, we, we've set up four already, and we're in the process of uh, setting up a further two, which will take us to six. We're very excited by the people who are leading the four that we've announced so far. Uh, we think that we've got a good breadth of people who are distinguished scholars, um, and uh, so we're very encouraged by that. Re the research hubs will issue calls for research where we're looking for pilot projects. We've also issued our general call where we had, I think, 90 applications in response to our first general call. We honestly expected to get maybe 20. We had over 90. So a huge response. It's been fascinating going through those. We've just made the awards to the uh, first two um, projects that we're going to support. And those projects, can you tell me anything about the area those projects are in? Well, I'd like to tell you exactly what they're about, but we're in this slightly uh, awkward time that the, project, the, the applicants know about it. Everybody's been informed, but, um, you know, there's, there's a, a sort of period between informing somebody they've won it, them saying they're delighted, and actually getting the contracts all signed, sealed, and delivered. And so it's difficult to be completely concrete. But the first project uh, is in a post-Keynesian framework, uh, and it looks to bring 
um, uh, feminist uh, economics into a formal uh, modeling uh, process. I think that's, that's uh, enough to say. On the second one, it's really about anthropological processes within decision making in uh, monetary policy, um, which is, uh, we hope, uh, going to involve um, key policy officials as well as academics. Well, those sound both very interesting indeed. So it's an interesting question what you really mean by macroeconomics, because in a sense you could argue that macroeconomics is a, is a sort of term that's specific to a particular methodology and say complexity economics would see no difference between micro and macroeconomics. So where does, for you, where does macroeconomics stop, <laughs> if you like? You're, you're absolutely right. It's um, one that uh, occasionally comes up in our management um, uh, team meetings. And I think that the key point is that in the Research Council's initial call, it was actually labelled as understanding the macroeconomy, which is quite a clever way of avoiding you know, some tricky labels of what is macroeconomics and what is not. Um, what do we mean by the macroeconomy? Well, we mean the whole. Um, now, that doesn't need to stop at national borders. And in fact, our very first hub was about globalisation specifically because we quite clearly uh, don't live in the sort of national borders that are often portrayed in straightforward macroeconomic, in inverted commas, models. In other words, where we have a government that sets interest rates for that country that defines the currency and the tax base for that country. Well, that's not really true. Even the Bank of England recognise that more than half of the interest rate movements in the UK are influenced by international factors. So those sort of boundaries aren't quite so straightforward today as they perhaps were in the past and have often been in simple macroeconomic models. So the easiest thing I can say that it involves the whole, um, that shouldn't be taken to mean uh, either at the global level or nation state level, because actually one thing that's been very interesting is about what about the influence of social groups? So in macroeconomics, we've often thought macro is really the aggregate of individuals and bringing together micro. And we often talk about micro foundations, which would typically mean the individual or a firm. Well, what about um, groups of people in a country? You know, many of our values um, uh, uh, and perspectives are made up by our peer groups and sociologists often talk about groups, how our values are formed, how they change, how we see people as, in, as insiders and outsiders. Yet this is really this sort of meso level has largely been ignored um, uh, uh, in economics because it's neither macro nor micro, but it clearly is part of what constitutes understanding the macro economy and how we, for example, achieve cooperation as a foundation for economic success. So I don't want to sort of try and put it in one box called macro and one box called micro. It's about understanding the macro economy. So it could be that we move to MISO-founded macroeconomic understanding. It could certainly be uh, bringing in what happens, uh, for example, to how our preferences get shaped, that they're not all um, uh, uh, fixed and intertemporally stable and given, that perhaps they are, in fact, influenced by groups in society. That's one possible area of uh, uh, future research. So, you know, this was quite prevalent in a debate in the 60s and 70s. On one side, you had um, uh, Albert Hirschman and Amartya Sen, and on the other side, you had the Chicago economists. Well, you know, in economics, that debate got resolved, but in the real world, we see more and more uh, various sections in society become, becoming perhaps more fractured and losing some of this social cooperation, which is indeed the very foundation um, uh, of macroeconomics and of course exactly what Adam Smith wrote in his other book The Moral Sentiments which um, has tended to be forgotten by economists. So and I suppose institutional economics have continued with that haven't Indeed. they? Indeed. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things you, you said early on was uh, one of the perceptions around macroeconomics was that it had become detached uh, from the, the, the policy community um, how do you intend to reattach uh, uh, macro, the understanding the macroeconomy into the, the, the policy community? 
So um, each one of our research hubs uh, is set up and defined by a policy relevant question. So all the, the sort of ones that I, I, I gave uh, before are clearly important policy relevant questions. How do we achieve a sustainable economy is, is policy relevant for all of us. And so in the structure of the hubs, we have made it clear that every piece of research we're going to fund has to have a policy relevant perspective on it. Now, this is not something that gets tagged on at the end. If we don't see that this is a major policy issue to address, it's not going to get funded. That's for somebody else. It's not for us. We're not saying it's right or wrong research. It's just not for us. So uh, the whole way that we've structured this has been um, uh, to be very clear that the projects that we're going to fund have to be in this direction. So that's, that's the main way that we're trying to achieve this. We also, in many of our discussions, we have people who work on the policy side taking part in our discussions. So we have representatives uh, from the Bank of England, um, the Department of Business, uh, Innovation, Energy uh, and Skills uh, come along. Uh, also, the Treasury has had um, people come along to our meetings. So we try to also engage policymakers at that stage. Many of the um, uh, conferences uh, and workshops that we hope to be uh, carrying out will also be bringing in various policy-making institutions, perhaps the OECD as well, who've been working on many of these areas. So we're, we've set it up and we hope to engage very much with policymakers as a way of enforcing that link is always ever-present throughout all of the work that the network undertakes. And what about the, the broader public? Uh, you may be aware that the RSA uh, recently completed two years of work on the, uh, engaging with the broader community on understanding economics and uh, economy. I've uh, uh, also done extended work uh, trying to engage the, the wider community uh, and, and they've discovered that most people are what they call aversive to economics uh, in that they, they find it very difficult to engage with technical, boring uh, uh, excluding, if you like, uh, and and that I suppose you could argue that a lot of the arguments from a macroeconomic viewpoint around Brexit it fell on deaf ears, maybe partly as uh, as a result of that. Where, how can you get to that wider community if we are really building a broader understanding, maybe a communal understanding of how the economy works? So, let me start off by um, wanting to pass my congratulations to the Royal Society of Arts and also to economy.org. Um, the RSA, I think they've um, produced a, a terrific report and done a huge um, amount for showing how social and public engagement can really be done in a really uh, effective and real world sort of way, not just lip service in really doing it. So I think that's been a, a great achievement. Um, we work uh, closely with many of those organizations that uh, whose raison d'etre is really um, public engagement, whether that's economy.org, the post-crash economic society, Rethink Economics, are all people we have regular dialogues with. We are talking to them about supporting uh, some of their uh, conferences, how we can do joint conferences. They are much better at it than we are in terms of engaging with the public. So we're quite... Um, how can I put it, opportunistic in the sense that we're more than happy to work with them and for them to help us in that regard. I should say that uh, one thing that we're conscious of is we can't achieve everything all at once. And fundamentally, rebuilding macroeconomics is a research-based network. Um, we take public engagement seriously. We will be doing much more of it once we have some um, findings on the research that we're supporting. So it's a question of, of, of sequencing to a certain extent. But it's also very important to know what you want to get out of public engagement. It's very uh, uh, time intensive and expensive. You need to know what you're trying to achieve. And that's something that is really still an ongoing debate uh, within the network. We will be very happy to receive ideas we are in discussions, as I said, with those organizations you've spoken to, but also the BBC about what is the best way to try and achieve this. And at the moment, it's not our priority because we don't actually have any research findings to talk about. But as we go through the four years, then it will be our priority and certainly towards the end, it will be. 
But we're really having those discussions at the moment to think about how can we be most effective and what do we want to achieve by this sort of public engagement. But we do recognise uh, it's something we want to do, but also uh, it's something that should be an obligation given that we have public funds. Great. And just to, uh, to end with, I suppose one of the maybe the, the most crucial points is that uh, from what you're talking about, you want a, a genuinely creative process uh, bringing different disciplines in. Traditionally, of course, academia has been tendency to be very organised around disciplines with their own set of language. And, and of course, researchers are sometimes known for you know and bringing out their the, the research idea that they've had for ages and now they think there's a chance to actually do it. How, how are you going to make sure that this is a genuine conversation and genuine creative process that something at the end comes out which maybe we wouldn't have expected at the beginning? Well, let me first of all mm. say I completely recognise what you're talking about. So, uh, you know, if you had an economist talking about um, uh, one particular subject and somebody from perhaps other social sciences then they can often seem to talk about cross purposes and left to their own devices while they may invite the other party there isn't a genuine exchange i think having a management team where we have you know three of the five are, are not economists the room when we have our discovery meetings when we have our workshops uh, have tend to be well at least half if not more non-economists um, in the sense that there's not a feeling that the economists are dominating the space here. So there is an exchange, a genuine exchange there. And then it becomes incumbent on the management team when it makes its final selection of the pilot projects that it's choosing, that it's careful to pick the ones that have genuine um, uh, interdisciplinary, that are trying something new. Because you're completely correct that of the 90 plus research applications we had in, it was quite easy to identify a lot of the old ideas. And I think in this, um, you know, John Maynard Keynes is so often was completely correct when he observed that it's not finding the new ideas that is most difficult, it's leaving behind the old, was exactly right. And you can see how the old, just reviewing the application, still have hold of people and how they contextualise their research uh, frameworks and agendas. I think and I hope by when people see the projects that we are uh, supporting, they'll realise that when we say genuinely new and ambitious projects, we actually mean it. We're not funding things that are respectable macroeconomics that are going to get into a nice journal because it's a safe thing for us to do. That hasn't been what we've chosen. It's quite clear it's not what we've been chosen. And so I hope through this process, people will start having more confidence that we are actually good for our word, that we are willing and, and, and looking for genuinely new and ambitious inquiries into helping us understand the macro economy. And at the end, you have four years in all, don't you? So in four years' time, um, what, will, what will a successful uh, Network Plus uh, result look like? <clears throat> We'll have a roadmap uh, which will be directed towards the Economic and Social Research Council, which will point out um, perhaps one or two, perhaps more, I can't prejudge, uh, future directions of research that we think are genuinely exciting and hold a real possibility to make a step change in uh, macroeconomics and understanding the macroeconomy. That may be through looking at the institutions or the subject itself, that the Research Council can then take and think, well, how can we build upon this, perhaps in future research calls, in um, driving future funding in a way that achieves its ultimate goal of transforming macroeconomics back into a, um, uh, uh, a real-world social science designed to look at real-world uh, macroeconomic challenges. Lord knows there's enough of them around uh, as we look around the world and you know in our small way we're trying to bring in some ideas to try and look at and address some of those questions so that's for me what success would look like that we've, we've made some steps and some progress towards that prior to handing over that um, uh, uh, roadmap to the research council we will be going 
around the main universities and talking to people about what we found, what we thought is, was most interesting, and really uh, not only testing what we think the roadmap is, but also showing people what has been done, who are the interesting people, and so trying to achieve a degree of continu continuity in those research hubs and those research ideas uh, after the end of the four years. Yes, because it's sort of interesting, you could come up with a, a suite of saying you should do some more research in here or more research there, but uh, in a way, one of the things you said early on, that there had been a monoculture, <clears throat> and uh, maybe that suggests the structure of how macroeconomics has been done, or the, the relationships, or the disciplinary boundaries, and so on, uh, are problems, as well as the actual research topic. So what, within your remit, can you say about that sort of institutional question? Well, that's very important, and thank you for uh, reminding me of that. So our second uh, hub, research hub, is slightly different to all of the others, and we always knew that it would be slightly different. And that is because it exactly asks, it looks at those economic institutions such as academia and policy making institutions and asks what is it about the perpetuation of economic ethos or these uh, silos of understanding of what macroeconomics is. Is there a problem there? And again, of course, we have to, we will approach this in an open mind. We've called this uh, hub, do we have confidence in our economic institutions? So it's going to look at the main policy making ones, but also academia. What happens there? Why is it like this? People have suggested things such as the uh, research excellence framework, um, perhaps leads to more conservative research agendas. Uh, people have uh, asked about the dominance of certain universities in terms of the main um, research publications and so on and so forth. But there are also wider uh, issues such as the networks between some of these universities and the policy making institutions and so on. So that also is going to be something we're going to put under the spotlight. And it is a slightly different hub, which I think you're exactly right. We have to start asking ourselves, what are there things that are blocking uh, some of these innovations that need to be made um, uh, in order to respond to how the world uh, evolves. So that is going to be specifically something that we look at and will be part of, of course, the final roadmap. So that could, in a way, be some of the more dramatic and uh, controversial findings uh, of this, this centre. Well, the beauty of um, the research project of having some uh, independent-minded people on the management committee, but also the advisory group, but also the tradition of uh, the, the National Institute is we hope that we will uh, not only be ambitious but feel free uh, to ask some difficult questions and to open these things up for debate. Of course there's a limit to what we can achieve. Um, there's only so much uh, funding and um, we're asking a lot of people to contribute a lot of time, a lot of which is pro bono. So, um, but, you know, the, the, the intention, the complete intention is to be as open and as thorough and um, uh, ambitious as possible in asking these questions of what about macroeconomics and how it's uh, taught and researched, how it's practiced in these institutions, uh, but also, what else can we learn from other social and physical sciences? Again, once again, and only because it's to address the real world, because we feel there's enough challenges out there. That is what macroeconomics is fundamentally about. It might be in a very rarefied form, but we have to keep this focus on. This is about the real world and addressing some of the challenges. We don't have a single answer for them, but there are enough challenges out there that we have to um, uh, start turning our attention to. Thank you very much, Angus.